right. So, Tony, I apologize. You were at my uh, workshop this past Saturday and have probably already seen all of this. But um, so this past Saturday, I had an advanced training workshop for Master Gardeners and it was a two hour workshop and we, pr we went pretty in depth on monarch migration. But um, today I'm just going to show some, share some highlights with you of monarch migration because it is a really fascinating natural phenomenon that um, is going on right under our nose. So the first thing I wanted to mention is that monarchs, um, a year in the life of a monarch, there are four generations per year of monarch butterflies. The overwintering generation will live for anywhere from six to eight months. So they actually live all winter long in Mexico. And then the rest of the year, the other generations, they only live for about a month. They breed, they lay eggs, and that's about the end of their life cycle. But that overwintering generation lives for several months. So that's kind of interesting in and of itself. Now, one thing I did wanted to mention is I wanted to show you this map here, and you can see here in central Mexico, this is the Sierra Madre Mountains of Mexico, that's where monarchs go. Monarch butterflies spend their summer in this part of the United States and in southern Canada, and they spend the summer here breeding and reproducing, and as weather starts to get cooler and days start to get shorter, they start their annual migration to Mexico. And this is where they end up. So it's pretty fascinating. And this is just a picture of the mountain range there in Mexico. Now, just some facts about their migration is they can travel between 50 and 100 miles a day. And it can take them about two months to get all the way to Mexico. They fly anywhere from 15 to 25 miles per hour and a lot of times they will uh, ride thermal waves. So they don't just fly nonstop that whole time. They will kind of ride wind gusts and other things so that they won't expend so much energy during that migration. And some of them fly up to 3000 miles to reach their winter home. They're, they're spending the summer in either the northern U.S. or southern Canada, and it can be th about 3,000 miles for them to reach that over site. So if you think of a monarch butterfly, they weigh about as much as, as a paper clip, and just think about how fragile they are, and for them to be able to travel that amount of, of distance is just, it's pretty amazing, I think. So once they get to Mexico, they overwinter in these fir tree forests, and these forests are about two miles above sea level. So they're pretty high up in the mountains. And the average temperature range in these forests is anywhere from 32 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit, so it doesn't quite get as cold as it does here. And there's just enough humidity in these forests to prevent them from drying out. So that's an important part of it as well. And one thing I do want to say, let me go back to this picture. Now, there are some monarch populations west of the Rocky Mountains over here in this area. And those monarchs don't migrate to Mexico. They actually will overwinter along the coastline of California. So the ones um, east of the Rockies migrate to Mexico. The ones west of the Rockies spend the winters on the coastline. So they cluster together on the trees to stay warm, and there can be tens of thousands of monarchs clustering together on a single tree. And although a single one doesn't weigh very much, if you get tens of thousands of them together, they can be really heavy. And these trees do a pretty good job of supporting that weight. Now, there are some broken branches um, occasionally, but for the most part, they do a great job of supporting that weight. Now, one thing I did wanted to mention is that we are very fortunate here in Missouri that we are on the main migratory pathway right through the middle of the United States. And you can see here this Monarch Highway, that's kind of what it's called, just kind of goes right down through here. And any of this orange section is going to be peak migration. 
And we are right in the middle of the migration right now. So take some time to spend some time outdoors and see if you see any of these migra or these monarchs migrating through. Now there is a cold front pushing into the area. So we've seen an earlier monarch migration this year than we have in the past, uh, but still be on the lookout because they're still gonna be coming through. And the fascinating thing about monarchs is we don't know how they find these overwintering spots. Now their great grandparents were in Mexico, but they've never been there themselves. So there's things like the magnetic pull of the earth, the position of the sun that can help lead them to those specific forests, but we don't really know for sure. Scientists are still researching it, but they just, they don't know what causes them to be able to find those specific forests down in Mexico. Now you may have heard that the monarch population, their numbers are going down and that's due to a lot of different things. And there's some challenges to both their numbers and their migration and weather can certainly affect that if it's really rainy, if it's really stormy, if it's really cold. Uh, drought. Drought can be hard on plants and plants that are drought stressed don't produce as much nectar as those that are getting plenty of water. So that can help them um, or that can hurt them from fueling up. Habitat, habitat destruction both here and in Mexico, although Mexico is doing a better job of protecting those forests. Disease is certainly a part of that. And then if you think of all the wildfires out in California right now, that is really having an effect on the, those monarch populations um, that are trying to migrate to Southern California right now. Now, I did wanna mention the tagging program. So there, there is a monarch tagging program. We do an event here at the Botanical Center every year where we tag monarchs. And basically a little sticker is put on the wing of the monarch it doesn't hurt the monarch, it can still fly. And the idea is that scientists and other people um, along the migratory pathway will find these tags and go to the website, which is monarchwatch.org and report those tag findings. And when those reportings are made, scientists are able to study the migratory pathway and learn about monarch populations and different things like that. But most of the tags are recovered at the overwintering site. Monarchwatch.org actually pays people to go up these forests and kind of sift through dead butterflies that didn't make it. And they'll pay them, I think five bucks for every one that they recover. So there is some financial incentives uh, to recover those tags as well. But there's a lot of good information that can be gleaned from these tags. And then the last thing I wanted to show you is Lisa Bakerink, our very own council member. Um, she is with Sister Cities, Springfield Sister Cities, and they take a group to Tlacopaki, Mexico every year, which is a sister city to Springfield, Missouri. And part of those trips is they go up to the overwintering sites. And she's been there several times. She shared these pictures with me and she's told me that, you know, pictures and videos just don't do it justice. It's just kind of something that you have to see in person. And I asked Lisa to share a little bit of her experiences with the overwintering site with us today. So Lisa, are you, are you still with us? I'm here, I'm with me, mama and me, papa. <laughs> oh, hi guys. Hi. <laughs> Good oh. to see you out there. Good to see you too. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. You did a great job summarizing. Um, yeah, we are very privileged in Springfield not only to have a great Mexican sister city in Tlacopaki, Mexico, but we're also very privileged to take trips there and also be able to see the overwintering side of the monarch butterfly. And so we've done that four times. And uh, our first half of our trip, it's about an eight day trip. The first half is in Tlacopaque. And the second part is uh, traveling and being in central Mexico where the monarch butterflies are. And like Kelly said, they always go to those same fir trees, the Oyamel fir forest. Um, they might be a, you know, a few hundred yards one direction or the other, but they always go to that, that same general spot. So you never quite know the hike you're going to have to have 
to get there. Um, it could be a mile, it could be three miles. <laughs> uh, they do have horses you can take um, at least part of the way, but it's pretty much a, a bucket list um, pilgrimage kind of journey and uh, definitely something I would recommend. Mexico is a beautiful state. And uh, down in Michoacan, where the monarch butterfly overwintering site is, uh, it's beautiful. Um, just a really unique uh, territory and, and land and horticulture and all of that. So, Lisa, have you ever heard back from anyone who has found one of the uh, monarchs that's been tagged here at the Botanical Center or through your efforts? Yeah, we have. Uh, there's been one that was found at the largest overwintering site, um, the sanctuary. There's different places where the monarchs go within those uh, mountains, and it's El Rosario, and it was found there. So it had made it all the way to the sanctuary and then died. Oh. Um, but, uh, and unfortunately, like Kelly says, when they find the tags, they have, the butterflies have, have passed on. Uh, but at least it gives them information about the migration window and all of that. Um, so, yeah, it's a good program. Uh, you know, that's some people would say, you know, the monarchs are in jeopardy in their numbers and you shouldn't participate in these kinds of programs. But it's really raised a lot of awareness. You know, people are paying more attention and they're planting milkweed. I have people all the time, just about every day, I get a call this time of year of people telling me a story that they've planted milkweed and they're helping the monarchs. So, Programs like Monarch Watch definitely, you know, they might damage a few butterflies by having people tag them, but overall it's probably helped support the population because people are more aware of the life cycle needs that a butterfly needs in the caterpillar stage, especially. People don't think about that. They think about butterflies needing nectar and they do when they're adults, but when they're a caterpillar, they have a very specific food that they have to eat. And for monarchs, that's milkweed. For black swallowtails, it's parsley, fill, <laughs> parsley, uh, dill, fennel, anything in the carrot family. So every every caterpillar has a specific plant or family of plants that it needs to eat. Okay. Sorry, well, I that... could go on and on. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that is that is fascinating. We we had talked as a staff of wanting to try and do educational component at each staff meeting because we want to do some things that add value, sure. add value to your life and as council members, because you've done the, the work of council, but we still want to add value to your life. And this is very, very uh, fascinating. And we hope everyone's take, gotten something from that. Does anybody you know, else have any questions? Or Lisa, go ahead. I'm just going to say it really does matter what you plant in your yard. Um, you know, we tend to go to a box store and pick out plants from Asia. They don't support any life cycles of our native species. Um, and when you plant native plants and things that um, caterpillars eat, you support not only the life cycle of that native species, but you support birds, you, sur you, you support everything at a higher level in the e ecosystem. So think about that next time you pick up plants for your yard, it matters what you plant. Yeah. Lisa, I saw pine trees at Walmart yesterday for sale, and I almost, tears of joy when I saw that. <laughs> it's better than Bradford pears. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's still, you know, Bradford pears are horrible. People still sell them at box stores, and I even saw some Japanese honeysuckle, which is hugely invasive, taking over our native species. Oh. Um, yeah, you just need to know, you need to know what to plant, and Kelly and I will be happy to talk with you about that if you need, need some advice. <laughs> that is awesome information. Very good. Well, thank you, ladies, for your information. It was really valuable and interesting. So appreciate it.